loves me or I have sinned. Those are the first words spoken when a person comes to make a confession to a priest. And confession is not just a sacrament for our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. It is for all of us. In the privacy of our own hearts, we can share all the ways that we have broken the heart of God. And then we can receive forgiveness right then and there. It just happens. Shazam. In the gathered community of this church each Sunday, we make a general confession. We just did that a couple of moments ago. And in that general confession, we share all the ways that we have marred the image of God in the church as well as in our lives. And again, we receive forgiveness then and there. And then, well, then there comes those times when we stumble and we fall hard. We can't get up by ourselves and we don't want the community of faith to know that we have fallen. We cannot forgive ourselves and so we believe that God can't forgive us either. Now I've been a priest for a long time and I've heard a lot of confessions over the years and that's the common theme. I can't forgive myself, which means God can't forgive me either, at least in that way of thinking. You see, a broken person can't imagine a God that would make them whole. Instead, they look in the mirror and all they see is shame, shame. And that's why in the Episcopal Church, we have the sacrament of reconciliation of a penitent. We don't call it confession. We call it reconciliation. To be reconciled to ourselves, to be reconciled to our loved ones, to be reconciled to our God. And really, all that is, is putting down that bag of garbage that we have been carrying. Just putting it down. And then hearing those loving words of Jesus to us, of love and forgiveness and when you're sitting down and making a personal confession face to face and hearing those words through another human being, there's power there. There's a lot of power there. And the rite of reconciliation, if you're not familiar with it, it follows along the storyline of the prodigal son. And I'm not going to ask you to do it right now, but you can pull up the Book of Common Prayer. Some of you have it in front of you. Certainly you can Google it and Google the rite of reconciliation. And you'll see the prodigal son story there. The rite begins with these words, Bless me, for I have sinned. And that's the first step in a holy journey. It's a sinner asking for a blessing, and not just asking for it, but receiving it. Because immediately, Immediately the priest says, The Lord be in your heart and upon your lips, that you may truly and humbly confess your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now the priest doesn't even know what's about to follow, but the mercy and blessing of God is already being called upon. Already. And it's not like when I hear the confession, I'm going, Oh my God! Are you kidding? You really did that? I can't deal with you today. <laughs> Someone else can, but I can't deal with you today. Now, I'm looking at two Episcopal priests in our congregation. Y'all have never done that, have you? No. Scotty, you might have. <laughs> but most of us, when we hear a confession, we just don't go, Oh my God, I can't believe you did that. Really? Tell me more. <laughs> I recently learned that in Eastern churches, and I love this image, the confessor welcomes the penitent by putting his stole over the head of the penitent and then putting his arm around his shoulder as if embracing him. It's a physical representation of acceptance and mercy 
and we are being reminded that we are not judged. That's the gift of reconciliation. Pope Francis has written that this has special significance because we're social beings, and forgiveness has a social implication. My sin wounds mankind, my brothers and sisters, and society as a whole. Now, the service of reconciliation in our prayer book continues. And the penitent then says, Holy God, Heavenly Father, you have formed me from the dust in your image and likeness and redeemed me from sin and death by the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through the waters of baptism, you clothed me with a shining garment of his righteousness and established me among your children in heaven. But I have squandered your inheritance of your saints, and I've wandered far in a land that is waste. You hear the words of our gospel there? You just heard it. Those are the words of the chronicle. I have wandered far in a land that is waste. And sometimes, you and I can wander so long in the land that is waste, we don't even know how we got there in the first place. And it doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to be those big sins, or at least what we consider big sins. It doesn't have to be murder or stealing or adultery. And some of you were here two weeks ago when we left those out, when we read the Ten Commandments. I'm here to remind you, you still can't do those. You still can't do those. But sometimes when we think about sin, we think it has to be something that big, something that huge. But most of us know when we have sinned, most of us know right then and there, something has been broken. It's been broken. Like, have you ever tried to move some pots around in your garage? And not that I'm speaking from personal experience, but those pretty clay pots and you're trying to move it one, from one place to another, something slips and falls and it shatters. It's broken. And then you have to pick up the pieces again. That's something what sin is like. Something shatters and it's broken, and we're trying to pick up the pieces, but you know what? As Christians, Jesus is the one who says, no, look, I've got that for you. Let me take care of that. That's what sin is. But again, we think sin as being one of those big things. But I think sin is a lot of the little things added up. What about the cross word with a family member? And suddenly, there's a series of cross words within the family. And suddenly, and it usually happens over Thanksgiving, over dinner. You made cauliflower when you know I hate cauliflower. You did that on purpose. No, I didn't. You've always liked my brother best. You know, it's step by step by step by step. And suddenly there's this huge gulf that seems insurmountable. And you look at the wreckage, the wreckage of what was once a loving family. You say, how did we get here? How did I get here? How did I get to the land that is waste? You know, God... God can't be there for me, not for me. But that's why we have Jesus. Jesus is God coming to us in the flesh to tr show us the true nature of God. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. And I get tickled at how many people, when they want to quote law, they go to the Old Testament. They forget that all the law was fulfilled in Christ. And that law is love. Pope Francis has written that the name of God is mercy. I love that phrase. The name of God is mercy, and that mercy is God's identity card. And St. Francis, um, well, he may be a saint someday, but Francis writes that the church is showing her maternal side, her motherly face, to a humanity that is wounded. She does not wait for the wounded to knock on her doors. She looks for them on the streets. She gathers them in. She embraces them. She cares for them and makes them feel loved. 
And Francis says, and so I am ever more convinced this is a Kairos, God's time. This is a Kairos. Our era is a Kairos of mercy and opportune time. Now I too believe this is Kairos time, God's time, a time of mercy, and loud voices would have us believe otherwise. But Jesus comes to us with open hands, hands that will soon be nailed to a cross. And Jesus come to, comes to us with open hands of love that says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus comes to us in mercy, in mercy. Jesus comes to caress, not to crush. Jesus comes to us. The real hero of this parable is the Father. And it's here that we learn that no human sin, no matter how serious, can prevail over or limit mercy. And to quote another pope, this one, John Paul I, who, had he lived, I think would have been a lot like Francis. John Paul I said this about God and the Father. John Paul I wrote, He waits. He waits. Always. He waits. And it's never too late. That's what he's like. That's how he is. He is a father. A father waiting at the doorway who sees us when we are still far off, who is moved, and who comes running towards us, running towards us, embraces us, and kisses us tenderly. We are not here to condemn, but to help bring about an encounter with the visceral love of God's mercy. Beloved, that is what happens when we are reconciled to God through Jesus. Now, you don't have to make a private confession. I've already outlined the three confessions. You can just say, I'm sorry to God, then and there, and you're forgiven. You can make the general confession, and as you just heard, then and there, you are forgiven. Or you may feel the need to make a private confession. The rule of thumb in the Anglican Church is, and I love this, all may, none must, some should. <laughs> Only you know what, if any, applies to you. Only you. But I will tell you this, there's an amazing grace that comes at the end of the sacrament, and it is such an honor to be part of this sacrament of reconciliation. It's one of the great honors of the priesthood right up there with baptism and the Holy Eucharist to sit with somebody who is finally sitting there and throwing off their garbage and allowing that to be just hauled away. There's an amazing grace that happens. And I have yet to come to the end of this rite without tears and a smile because the first words of reconciliation as I've said, are, bless me, for I have sinned, spoken by the penitent. The last words, well, the last words are spoken by the priest. Now there is rejoicing in heaven, for you were lost and are found, you were dead, and now are alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. Abide in peace. Abide in peace. I love that phrase. I love that word. Sister Essie, who was with us for the Daughters of the King dinner on Thursday, talked about her love of words and digging in to the root words. So, of course, I had to dig in a little bit to what abide means. You won't be surprised to find that the word abide is derived from the word abode. Abode. Your home where you live. So my beloved, we're sent out with the words to make peace in our home where no sin will trouble us, where God has put all sins behind us. So make 
an abode of peace that you can abide in. Don't bring in the garbage with you. Throw it outside where it belongs. My beloved, <coughs> abide in peace. Abide in peace. The Lord has put away all your sins. And the last words are, thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.